go. Hello. Welcome to uh, this DEI call. This call is a um, partnership between the United Way of South Alabama, Southwest Alabama and the Coalition of um, the South Alabama Coalition of Nonprofits. Sorry, I tried to combine both of those titles. Um, and we are thrilled to be with everyone today. We are starting a new round of DEI sessions and the committee that facilitates this process wanted to really go back to the basics or um, discuss representation and why representation matters. And so on today's call, we are gonna do just that. Um, we are excited to have Chandra Brown, the Executive Director of Lifelines Counseling Services with us today. And she will be joined by uh, United Way's very own Brad Martin, our VITA Program Manager. And um, also, Dr. Raul Richardson is, is slated to hop on the conversation as well. And he is with the Genesis Global Group. So again, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Brad, I'm going to pass it over to you and let you drive this bus. All right, let me turn off my phone because it's ringing really loudly. You probably heard it. Welcome, everyone. Happy National Sandwich Day. I got a notification that today is National Sandwich Day. So if you are eating a sandwich with us right now, you're in good company. Um, but for a moment, um, I want to I want to put down the sandwiches and pick up the keyboards for just a second. And Chandra, if you will be my eyes for me, um, I want to ask you as an audience when we talk about representation, and and I honestly, um, I think there are more than one answer to this question. So th there, this is not a quiz. This is more of a level set or a temperature check. Um, what when you heard you were coming to a presentation about representation and why representation matters, what does that mean to you? What does representation as a term mean? When I looked it up and tried to find a concise definition, I got a bunch of blah, 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 that was kind of all over the place. So I want to see where your heads are at, and then we can talk about the different ways that representation factors in. You can do that in the chat if you like, and someone can read it. Chandra, maybe you can read it for me. I will. Uh, Kim said, finding a way to include all populations in a community. That's a good answer. It's an excellent answer. Anybody else have any thoughts? Can you repeat the question, Brad? Yeah. So we're just asking, what does representation mean to you? If we were going to say why representation matters, what is it? What is what does it mean to say representation? Uh, and, and and Kim's answer is is on point for sure. I just want to see if there's any broader thoughts anyone has about the subject before we kind of get started. Rhoda shared having a voice, being heard, being seen. Okay. Excellent. And we all we all see probably representation a little bit differently based on our frame of reference, right? I'm a communications um, may I was a communications major in college, and the first concept they teach you a frame of reference. And so, what you're familiar with, what you know, affects how you view a lot of things. And I think representation is one of those. My definition of representation is heavily colored by the concept of disability because of the fact that I'm blind and I grew up with deaf people and I, you know, that's just, that's my experience. Obviously for many people, we're talking about representation from a racial perspective, from an ethnic perspective, from a uh, perspective of someone who is any number of things, homeless, people experiencing homelessness, um, you know, any group, I think that is um, not considered the standard um in any way you know in some way is, is it looks at representation a little bit differently um i will tell you from my perspective um i think of representation in terms of how people see people with disabilities in their world 
And for blind people, I think, and I'm actually really curious to know how you feel about this as an audience. Do you think for most people, I think, and maybe I'm wrong about this, people see blind people through television and through the movies. Um, I think most people probably um, don't encounter blind people on a regular basis. Is that a fair statement or am I way off base? And I that say be that because when I was a kid growing up, do you know how many people thought I was going to be the next Stevie Wonder or Ray Charles just because I like music? But for most people, and I grew up in the 70s and 80s, that's who they thought of when they thought of blind people. Um, And so the sort of the assumption was, oh, you must play the piano. Well, a little. I don't love it. Um, and so I think we all tend to, to to sort of see things through the lenses that we are given. But how does then the question becomes in our work in the nonprofit sector? Well, let's first talk about our work with each other in terms of our own offices or our own organizations. Um, what does representation look like in terms of the workplace and what is there's a it, I, I read an article where someone drew a distinction between diversity and representation anybody want to take a stab at that the difference between diversity and representation For me, diversity is simply having <clears throat> persons of varying um, persons who are different from me, different from each other present and representation is allowing everyone to have um, to participate. Participate, yes. Um in 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 what way are you thinking like um i guess if we're thinking about a workplace yeah. um representation is allowing um these persons of of different different uh abilities different skin colors different religions different economic statuses to um equally access uh the things at work to serve on committees equally to um, have voice in decisions equally exactly uh, you're exactly right so you know if if i run a company but and i have people who are um Again, I'll go back to my my comfort zone a little bit, and then we'll stretch out. But if I if if we hire folks with disabilities, but they're only working in the warehouse, and they're not in administration, they're not in other arenas, then you may have a diverse workplace in that way, but you may not. It may not be representative of the community as a whole. So if you have leadership and you have middle management who represents those different groups that you're talking about, then you have representation. So um, where I see this, I always say, I cannot be the only blind person doing taxes, right? I just can't be. Um, and I don't know anyone else who's blind who does taxes. But this year I was approached by uh, a professor at a community college in Colorado because she's teaching a tax course and she's got a blind student. And so for me, I feel like I am the representation of the fact that yes, you can be blind and you can do taxes. Does that make sense? It does. And then also uh, Brad, Dr. Richardson has raised his hand. Oh, great. He may have something to add. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, greetings to all of you. Um, I'm not necessarily pushing back on any of the dialogue you've had to this point in time, but um, I, I think that 
there are two elements here that are representative in both groups when it comes to the discussion about diversity and representation. Firstly, the employer, if they were dealing about a work-based relationship or situation, has to see value and respect in the qualities, characteristics, abilities, and what that person brings to the table as it represents itself to the organization. Um, it's, it's not just about having somebody who has whatever uh, perceived limitation in the warehouse versus the office versus the front desk. We, you know, we used to do a thing when we uh, dealt with human resources related issues, uh, what we called like a, a realistic job onboarding process, which was a mechanism by which you looked at the job you were filling and then looked at the skills, education, abilities, and experience of the person relative to their ability to be successful at that particular job. And I think when you talk about diversity, it's not just about having black or brown or male or female or transgender or um, li uh, ability, you know, mobility limitations or blindness. It's about respecting, recognizing the abilities, talents, education, and experiences of the person and how that contribution has, brings value to the organization. And simply by putting a black person in versus a white person, if that person doesn't have the experiences, background, education, everything else, I don't know if it really truly really brings, brings uh, value to the organization. And similarly, when you have a discussion about representation, um, let me just, um, since Brad's been doing this on a couple of occasions, I'll just use myself as an example. You know, there are people within my community as a black man that may not see me as they see themselves as black or brown persons. And because they don't know me or don't know my background, experience, education, or what I'm willing to contribute to the conversation, even though I'm present in the room, I'm not included necessarily because my representation hasn't been respected and or valued. And so I think when we talk about this, this conversation of diversity and we talk about this conversation about representation, there's a little bit of a more of a drill down that has to happen that really adds value to the conversation of the individual's contributions to the organization. And until we get to the place where we really see that, then conversations about equity are, are, are largely lost as well. So, you know, we can harken back to the days of the uh, the Boston Tea Party, you know, uh, no taxation without representation. In other words, they wanted to take something from the individuals, but they didn't want to offer them anything in return. And that's largely about respect, recognition, and understanding and identifying those things, characteristics, abilities, talents, educational experiences that are the things that are real value. And until we respect people for those things, then we're never going to get into a conversation about a, bl a blind tax representative. Because you know what? They saw your blindness and thought about Stevie Wonder, never even took the time to recognize the capacity, education, and experience you had that lend value to their particular operation. So I, I just want to make that as a not a heavy lift, but just to kind of raise the, the bar, so to speak, of what we're looking for, what we're looking at, no matter what the group is uh, that's involved in the conversation and understand where that representation lies and where the true essence of diversity occupies a space that can be respected, valued, and then make a contribution that's worthwhile. And that's why you're on this call. <laughs> uh, very well said. And, and you're absolutely right because, um, you know, if we, if we are bringing in, you know, you've made me think of something that I, um, Years ago, they put out a call for a steering committee and they were looking for all sorts of different groups of people to serve. It was it was a for the taxpayer opportunity network. So basically tax people who do what I do from all different areas and they were looking at geographics and they were looking at they were looking for people with disabilities and whatever. And I said, no, at the time I wasn't doing this work for long. I said, nobody knows me. I'm probably not going to get elected, but they may pick me because I'm blind and they're looking for people with disabilities and there's nobody else who's going to fit at least the blindness category. Now that was probably short-sighted on my part um, because what happened was I got chosen for the committee, but my visual impairment had very little to do with the work that I ended up doing on that committee. So even in my own mind, I didn't represent myself well. Um, and and so you're right. They obviously chose me um, and I've I've been sort of valued for the, the tax work that I do. Um, so so you're right. Um, 
Do we have any feedback before I move to a, move us to a slightly different topic? Brad, there's no additional comment. Okay, thanks. Um, let's talk about though how how being visible in our own organizations and Chandra, maybe you can help me with this. Uh, being being visible in our own organizations affects or best serves the clients that we serve. Um, and I'm thinking in terms of people who come in and see themselves in the people providing service to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's absolutely important. I mean, I think that I can say for myself, like if there's a certain doctor I want to go to, if there's a certain therapist I want to check out, if there's a certain, I don't know, program that I want to see, like the first thing I'm going to look at is, um, do they have someone or does that organization like reflect my values? Does that organization have folks there that um, look like me? Do they have folks there that understand my plight in the world and my position and the things that I need? So, you know, that's the first thing I'm going to look for uh, if, if whoever that I'm going to like spend my money with. Um, I know in coming to Lifelines, that was something that was important to me was therapy and mental health is important. I know it's important in the, you know, communities that I was raised in. I am uh, Black, female, Catholic, um, all the things, many more than just that. But uh, knowing that, like, are there folks that will understand um, what I have been and been through and what I need? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was really important in building a staff, you know, looking at the data that we have as an organization, 75 percent of the calls are from um, women. Women make the first calls. We have a split between 50 percent black, 50 percent white. So um, we really started looking at like what would it look like if we double down and said that we want our services to be woman centered. It doesn't mean that anybody else in this community cannot come. But what it means is that we are going to come from a lens of the women that come to our organization. Like what is it that they need? And then how can we build services around those needs? Right. So like, all right, if she's coming looking for help because she needs help with money or she is really trying to think about like, is this marriage working for me or should I stay in this relationship that I'm in? So what are some other things that she may need access? If she really starts revealing that she's been impacted by abuse and trauma, that she needs to leave, um, what do we need? Does she need transportation? Does she need childcare? Does she need food? Does she need clothes? Does she need? And so like, how can we provide those services and then make partnerships and connections around that so that this person who's already unveiled something that's really kind of deep and important to us doesn't have to go place to place to place to place. So like, we're not um, um, deepening the trauma by creating a community member that has to go out, you know, and search for themselves. If they want to do that, that's cool. Um, but how can we help and support them in their biggest time of need? I think that's important. I think it's also important to say, yup, I'm a Black cisgender female. And am I thoughtful to, um, how can I be a thoughtful ally to my folks that are in the LGBTQ community who are Spanish speaking, who are all the other things, like what are the things that I need? Just like I needed these things, I'm sure they all need these things too. So what can we do and how can we put their voices forward? You know, how can we stand and serve as allies? Um, and, and like really, what does that look like, you know? And so I think like that's important because I know it's powerful in so many subtle ways to see a community that looks like you, that embraces you, that's like, um, you know, and not just when I'm in good times, but really when I'm going through those dark times and I don't feel as isolated, I don't feel alone, I don't feel like I'm the only voice in the wilderness experiencing what I'm experiencing. And you know, you something you've hit on has made me think about 
and I, I promise I'm not going down a political road, but one of the things that the pre this president has said is that he wanted an administration that looked like all of America. Mm -hmm. And so he has tried to create a diverse administration. And I think that that speaks to what you're talking about is we need to sort of represent the the people we serve in a way that we, and it makes us better allies, even if we are not in those groups. I, I think about advocacy, which is, which is something that, you know, I think we all need from time to time. Um, and I think about myself. Um, I am not, the ideal person to be speaking on on issues of deafness um we laugh all the time because in in school situations they 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 group sensory impairments together so they put deaf people with blind people in school and we can't talk to each other um all my friends that were deaf now that we're in our 40s and we're on facebook we can actually message back and forth and it leveled the playing field a little bit but we always had to have an interpreter right but growing up with that and then working extensively with the deaf community um, and with sign language interpreters, I think makes me a better advocate because that group is representative in my life, right? Like they, I, I, because I know the things that, that the, the barriers that they run into, um, I can, it makes being able to see the rest of the world uh, allows us to, to, to maybe be stronger allies. And at the same time, and I think about this in terms of board development, we need to, I think, when possible, have advisors who reflect our consumers. Like if you're going to have an advisory council for people uh, concer uh, concerning the needs of people experiencing homelessness, it's really helpful if you can have someone either who has experienced homelessness or is, uh, because their perspective is unique and it needs to be represented and it's stuff that we don't think about. I would not make necessarily the best advocate for some for a group that serves people in wheelchairs because I've never had to use a wheelchair. Um, doesn't mean I can't be an advocate. But I think that 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 part of this is about having the voices at the table who are firsthand directly affected by whatever the issue is that you're trying to solve. Does that make sense? Yes. And do we often avoid that? I, I don't know if saying avoid is the right word, but I feel like too often we don't see that. Well, well, because I think it's like, I think it's hard. I think sometimes you just, you have to mine for it, right? You have to yeah. find those communities. Like, you know, um, I remember several years ago when I did some accreditations, um, when I, 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 would, I went to, I think, New Jersey. And so they had some folks that were, they had a Spanish speaking therapist and the feedback was just amazing. Like I can come in, I can be myself. I don't have to. You know, I don't have to translate in my head and then kind of tell you, you also get the nuances of culture and community. And those are things that I don't have to explain. I don't have to go in depth with, you know, this person, they get it. Um, and so I think like when we talk about representation matters, like that's what that means. Having people, um, it just means I see you. It means I understand you. It means I get it. I get what you're going through. That's why we went through, you know, that's why we tried to mine because the folks are there. We just choose not to see them, right? It's easier to stay within the circles that we already have. I mean, and it could be, I mean, it's not, it's not like it could be, it is, you know, historical for us and all the things that we've gone through. And so we're just continuing to, perp to perpetuate it because it's easy instead of really kind of pushing back to say like, what do we want? Like for me, I want lifelines to reflect the community that we serve, like the total of that community. So how do we mine for that and find that? And I'll shut up because Raul has his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> that hand raising is not to silence anybody. <laughs> I was just talking in circles by that time. I was just going to throw no, ahead and no, things no. that were not important. <laughs> no, but you, you've made an observation that I think is really critically important. And I want to reflect back to that if we could just take a couple of steps back. 
you referenced that in your process, you began to identify by collecting data about the people that were calling, what types of people were calling, et cetera. And then you modified your behavior to reflect what you gathered relative to the data. And that made me think about, um, um, you know, after medical school, they do this thing called intensives, right? Where they bring people through like a list of other things. And everybody's like kind of really ticked off about it because they feel like they've already graduated. Why do I have to now do this week of other things? And in that particular week, what happened was they uh, assigned projects, you know, research projects. And this particular project was to identify why there was a 95% HIV positive infection rate in transgendered females. Now, first of all, for those of you that are not necessarily inclined, uh, maybe Rhoda can speak to this a little bit, but a 95% infection rate in any group is like mind blowing, okay? Uh, and then of course you say, well, how can this be? And how do we begin to understand what's happening here? And then they said, well, the transgender community persons, okay? But the problem was that the intake instrument that was being utilized in the Atlanta community medical system had never been revised and updated. So they were asking the same questions from 20 years ago that they were now asking in 2016. And the result was the responses they were getting were not necessarily reflective of the data as it relates to the integrity of the data because they didn't ask enough questions to drill down to find out who they were talking to. And if they, what we discovered was had they um, drilled down a little further and asked some questions relative to the, the individual client's experiences, they would have discovered that those individuals had um, uh, entered incarceration uh, genetically identifying as male, but then the trauma of incarceration and the violence of rape uh, and the survival mechanisms now had them, before they got out of jail, identifying as female. And so what happened was they may have been identifying as female, but their behaviors relative to the HIV population um, um, provided some, I'm not going to say it's totally responsible, um, behaviors that made them more vulnerable to the infection rate. So the point I'm making is, that we have a role and responsibility within the context of our organizations and community to constantly reflect and evaluate and make efforts to continuously improve and begin to understand better what we're asking, who we're asking, and what might be done to better that process. So, um, and in terms of this conversation about um, diversity and the representation element, you know, there are opportunities where if it's not properly managed, they can create more divisiveness than unity. And what I would say referencing specifically, and of course I'm gonna go back to my uh, particular representation group to whatever degree I even think I understand what that is. It seems to be frequently uh, morphing. But um, when organizations seek to insert uh, melanin content into their organizations to add the flavor of diversity, uh, if it's done without the res respect and understanding of the capacities of the individual, uh, even as Brad made reference to the administration uh, on the executive level saying that they wanted it to look more like America, I think in some cases you can do a disservice. So when he was looking to uh, get someone on the Supreme Court and it ended up being Katanji Brown, I don't doubt for one second she's capable, qualified, and everything else. But I think in that selection process, by saying, I want to get a black woman, suddenly her value seemed to have been diluted, in, the, in my opinion, in the, in the context of that conversation, because that meant she wasn't competing in the open waters against everybody else. Now that pool was limited to the specific uh, prescribed uh, pronouncement he made as to who he wanted to get. Um, and... I, I, I'm, I'm cautious about that because I've seen that happen on a number of occasions where, for instance, if the organization is not authentic in their integrity, their mission, their willingness, their desire to really show what that means. And so um, 
I want to add to my board or to my organization a black or brown person. Well, if I get a woman, then I can get a woman and a black or brown person and then not take respect for the fact that that woman had capacities, experiences and backgrounds that made her probably more valuable than some of the other people you may have chosen. So I, I just point that out as a, a mechanism for kind of just being really thoughtful and, and curative in our process in terms of how we identify people and how what process we submit them to and what are our end objectives that we're seeking to serve uh, because I don't want to diminish anyone um, by virtue of somehow or another limiting the pool of people that they were competing against and then not representing and respecting who they were. And then finally, I would say, relative to this conversation about diversity and representation, the, the real issue isn't just the respect and consideration for the person's capacity and what they bring to the table. The other part of this question is to be included, then not respected, appreciated, and valued doesn't afford us the opportunity for belonging. So there's, there's a distinction to be made between being inclusive and then including people and then elevating them within the context of being empathetic, kind, considerate, thoughtful, and um, making them feel like they're not just included, they belong to be at the table. And I, I think that's an element that we really need to be a little bit more thoughtful about as well. All good points. Well, I'll add I'm not as smart as Raul, but I'll tell you. Don't you try that now, my friend. They said they're looking for Katanji. I was like, yes, yes, <laughs> woo, woo, about time, about time, yes. So, sorry. <laughs> I was like, I didn't see it that deep. <laughs> I was like, agreed. She should have been a long time ago. But no, I mean, I think like when we were talking, we were talking about like, you know, um, I'll just speak for me, something that I've really, thank you, dang it, something that I really had to um, kind of settle myself in is to think that, you know what, I'm a complex human. I'm not just this, this, that, and this, which you outwardly see. I also have parents that I'm a caregiver for. I have a dog that I take care of. I have a husband whose birthday is today. You know, Oh, really? Tell him I said happy birthday. I will do. Um, I have, you know, we have so much more. I'm a godmama to five or six different folks that have claimed me and so many more that haven't. So, you know, I mean, we are so much more than what people see. I was talking to somebody at one point um, and they were telling me how there were a lack of black female leaders because growing up, we didn't see what we didn't see when we were growing up. And I had to say, you know what? I disagree. You didn't see that because maybe you only saw black women at the time. My grandma was a maid, you know, many grandmas during those times, that was their job or they were stay at home moms. So when she wasn't at home raising her kids, she was a maid or she worked at Head Start. And I'm like, but what you didn't know, that was just one image of her that you saw. But what you didn't know that at the church that she came up in, St. Francis Xavier, she was a mother of the church. You know, she was revered there and she was on every committee. So she was absolutely a leader there. And that's where I saw her. I may not have seen my mother as a leader in the school system where she spent 30 years, but she was a Girl Scout leader. She, you know, was one of the women that helped run St. Mary's when I was little. She was involved in every single thing that I did. So I did see leadership. Maybe I didn't see it as Katanji on the Supreme Court, which I think is amazing. But I saw it in so many different ways that I think led pathways to me to say, well, why can't I move a step further? Why can't I go and do this thing, that thing or the other thing, you know? And so when I really started thinking about those kind of complexities, what I really try to do with everybody else, because we often think of how, you know, what's the funny thing? You take your kids to the grocery store when I was raising my cousins and they would destroy everything. I'd be like, I had a bad day and they don't understand. But when it's Trista's kids in the grocery store, I'm like, Trista's not a good mama. I don't know what her problem is. Right. So <laughs> we have tougher times than other people. If I just stop, take a breath and give everybody that moment and that grace and know that they also have levels of complexity. You know, they also have the same needs and wants and desires that I do. So how can we find those spaces of commonality to support them in those times of need? You, you know, I, I wanna offer something, um, not specific to the Katanji Brown conversation, but um, many years ago, I was asked to lead a task force for diversity and inclusion. And initially at Mobile United, we had Mobile in black and white. 
And so when Joelle Lewis was uh, considering other things that were important in her life, she asked me if I would take over the task force. And I said, sure, I'd be glad to, as long as you hold my hand and kind of, you know, nurture me and walk me through this process. But one of the first things I said to her is we can't call it mobile and black and white. I mean, because Mobile's more than black and white people. And that's when we came up with diversity, equity, inclusion, the whole task force thing. But I, it was interesting because I kept thinking I was going to get fired from a non-paying job because um, I began to cultivate relationships with people that weren't at the table. You know, so I discovered we have five mosques in Mobile. So I, I reached out to the Islamic community. I reached out to the Jewish community, the agnostics, the atheists. I reached out to the South Asians, Cambodians, Laotians, Vietnamese. I reached out to what, for lack of a better word, forgive me, the, the group that might be represented by virtue of world's perceptives of their abilities versus disabilities. Um, and got folks from that community. I reached out to the LGBTQ community. And I was constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop when somebody was going to call and say, hey, look, Raul, we wanted you to do this diversity thing, but we really just wanted more black and brown college-educated Methodist people. And now you done went and stirred this thing up and brought all these other groups to the table. But it never happened. But the good news is, who knew that we'd come into a social unrest period like we saw with Brianna uh, Stewart and Ahmad, uh, Ahmad and George Floyd and all the other stuff? And you, you can't, in the middle of the hurricane, first establish a relationship with your neighbors. You need to be a friend indeed before you're a friend in need. And so since we had cultivated those relationships, we were able to have forums like this for people to be able to share and talk about what was going on in their, their lives, their minds, their thoughts, et cetera. And, um, and I think it's similar for this case. Now, Rhoda just made a point about being the representation part in work, life, general, and on TV. I, I want to, since we're in an evolving conversation about all of these topics, uh, LGBT, transgender, all these conversations, I just want to push back on the epistemology of words. Because one of the things that um, Chandra caused me to rec recollect is much as with the Mobile United thing, we determined that we needed to find leaders and leaders did not always exist within the framework of whatever academics told us it was gonna look like. So her grandmother was a leader in a real sense of the community, even though somebody else might have thought about her only as a maid, not seeing the Girl Scouts or the St. Mary's experience. And that's true in this situation as well. And for me, um, much as she chaired for Katanji Brown, as a young black boy growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I loved it when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. I loved it when boxers won world championships. I loved it when, you know, the NBA began to do things differently. Or Tiger Woods came out on the scene, even though he doesn't necessarily identify himself as black. The point being, we have developed an understanding of the word racism that I don't know really contextualizes what it really means. So if I told you that I was supportive of women's rights, someone might say, I'm a feminist. If I told you that I had a passion and a patron for the arts, then you might say, well, perhaps he's an artist. Yet somehow or another, when I'm an advocate for those elements of representation that reflect my presence in the community, I'm not a racist. It would seem that a person who loves their race would be used in the same kind of nomenclature when it comes to talking about artists or anything else. But the real danger isn't this idea of being proud of your race or being proud of your group or your whatever it is that you're being proud of. The real danger is in the word bigot, which is a person that is not just about ethnicity and race. It's about person that just got hatred for people that they don't know or understand and don't want them involved in some of the things that are going on in their world or community. And so I, I, I don't, um, I, I applaud Katanji Brown too, Chandra, okay? And um, I applaud any time, uh, as Rhoda so carefully pointed out, that um, celebrating those people, respecting, appreciating, valuing, empathizing, even if that's necessary, um, those people that are now brought into the conversation that weren't allowed to be in the conversation previously. So, um, and I, I think we got a comment here from Brian too, um, because I, I hope Brian doesn't mind this. Many years ago, when people started putting their, um, I don't know what we call it now, Brian, you know, the she, her, him, they. Pronouns. Pronouns, pronouns. right. Yeah, the pronouns. I remember calling Brian up because I was like, Brian, help me to understand what's going on with this. Every time I'm on a meeting now, I see people 
and it was just beginning at that time. And he helped me to understand it and, and, and in some ways embrace it. Um, but thank God I had a relationship with Brian because I needed to reach out to someone that could help me navigate what that, which I didn't understand. So um, I don't know. Uh, but I think he's, he's made some interesting points here uh, about beliefs and thoughts. And Can including... somebody read those? I'm sorry, I can't read them and listen. At the I'll read it. I'll read it. It says, I think that respect includes committing to learning from inclusion, not just including people with no end goal. Similar to what I've said, yes. And to share the learning received from inclusion for better understanding throughout an organization. Representation to me means, I should have Brian read this, right? Means not limiting or ignoring our beliefs and thoughts that prevent truly including others, especially when it comes to making decisions that affects the staff and clients. And I hope that makes sense. It absolutely makes sense, brother. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And to that point, the last point he made about the clients, um, I recently did for the United Way a conversation about bias, unconscious bias and stuff. And it's really important, back to the point that Chandra made, whether she was conscious of just how impactful that comment was, the data collected really helps you to understand better not only your own problems, biases, concerns as a professional with your clients or colleagues or anything else, but it also helps you to better understand um, a level of sensitivity and carefulness in your speech, your tone, uh, your posture and behavior when you're interacting with people. One of the most significant things we've done recently, and I remember Dr. Benjamin first started us with this, was bringing um, what we call community health workers into the scene to accompany people to their doctor's appointments. And that was such an important thing because typically a person that may be from Italy or Poland, or an immigrant of something that doesn't speak the language, has to bring a young child to try to interpret for the doctor mm -hmm. or nurse what they're experiencing or what the doctor now is gonna prescribe as a treatment. And that is not always the most comfortable situation. But by integrating, I'm not even sure if that's the right nomenclature there, but by using a, a, a community health worker that was Vietnamese or Cambodian or Laotian, they allowed that person to be able to share those thoughts, concepts within the context, not just of the language, but the cultural understanding of what was being communicated also. We have to recognize that our words are not just words, but they reflect certain cultural representations. So while I speak Spanish, I speak basically Puerto Rican Spanish. When I go to Spain, uh, Madrid, I have to use a different kind of Spanish. And in certain cultures, the, when you say, if I said to Rhoda, hey, you, that you in languages, in a lot of different words, Korean, Spanish, is not the same you you'd use for a senior citizen or somebody's grandmother. You know, so there's cultural representations within language that can only be achieved in true communication if, in fact, you have someone that's a part of the culture helping to articulate what the issue may be. And I just want to bring that, that as a point. That's really interesting you say that because in a different context, we see this um, in the deaf community, right? So I do tax returns. Tax returns are a very nuanced language of their own. I mean, just ask anybody who, when I say I'm teaching a tax class, they run out of the room. Um, but, and, the, and there is an overwhelming feeling in the tax prep the free tax prep world across the country oh well we just when they come they usually bring a family member and i say you know and 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 it's been explained to me and it makes sense right why would you assume it's okay to assume they'll bring somebody do you want your sister in your financial business maybe not right and so having an interpreter there and again, this is what I mean by this is what I meant by it makes me a better advocate for a community, even if I'm not a part of it, because it's represented before me. Right. So I understand the downsides of that. And I can say, no, this really is not a, an ex and you're talking about you're talking about uh, people bringing young children with them and that there's a whole movie. This is what started my trip down this road. Um, has anyone seen the movie Coda, C O D A? <laughs> I've not I still have I still haven't seen it yet, but I know we talked about it the other day. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the movie, but I, I was reading an article about it. And C O D A is an acronym for children of deaf adults. So if you are a hearing child and your parents are deaf, right? 
And everybody um, that I had heard thought it was just a, the best movie and this and that and the other and one best picture in, I think, 2018. And I read an article written by someone who is deaf who said, yeah, representation matters and it's great that they actually used deaf actors in the roles of deaf characters because that wasn't always the case. Um, but their complaint, which I had not thought of, is that the movie is still told in terms of the perspectives and the feelings of the hearing teenager. And they felt that some of the ways in which the deaf characters were portrayed as relying on their daughter to be their interpreter were inaccurate, that the Americans with Disabilities Act requires that when they go to court or they go to doctor's appointments, that they're provided with an, a licensed interpreter. And I had not thought of that. But, you know, in that perspective, um, you know, we, we don't tend to know what we don't know. And I think that, um, I, I think television and, and the movies have come a long way. I mean, I can remember when gay characters on television were almost always for comic relief. And it was kind of uh, looking back on it, you know, pretty demeaning in a lot of cases. Um, blind people are depicted as either people to be pitied in a lot of, especially older TV shows. Or if we're seen at all, we either are to be pitied or we've got some sort of savant-like ability to do something um that perpetuates stereotypes like oh you must have radar hearing um no i just tune into that information more and i realized that if i don't have those conversations with people it used to bother me to be the blindness poster child um when i was younger but what i realized is if i don't have those conversations with people they don't know what they don't know and and i whether I choose to be or not, I, I'm kind of representative of the blind experience for those folks because I, I'm, I guess, a little bit more unique than I like to admit. I like to fit in. Um, I've actually been accused of being ashamed of being blind. That is not the case. I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. It just doesn't define me. And so, um, you know, I had to grow to accept the fact that in some ways, for some people, I am a representative of the blind community. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. It does. It absolutely makes sense. I mean, and each time you talk about it, I talk, I think about um, Brad, like the same words, just flip out race or just flip out, you know, many exactly. of us who have certain issues, um, uh, you know, any other thing that, that isn't um, mainstream uh, that we face, you know, and the only thing that I can think, I'm like, well, and it's so funny because when you were like, well, most people don't have blind friends. And I'm like, yeah, OK, I get it. And then it's like, well, get new friends, find some friends. Like that's that's I think what um, I hear, you know, when I was reading Rhoda's comment or even the nuances of Brian's comment that like for us, for us not to take the action to go and understand and to learn and not put the onus on like during George Floyd, people would come to me and say like, I want to understand being black. And I'm like, nah, I ain't doing that for you. I mean, like it's books, read them, like find a book, you know, and then let's have a discussion. But I, I'm not, I'm not, first, I don't have the mental health to do that for you now. And secondly, that's not fair, you know? So go and learn. It's not fair for me to say, Brad, help me understand the blind experience. That's not, that's not fair. Like, so let me learn and educate myself and then come to you with a question or come to you so we can actually have a dialogue that's meaningful and can be supportive of you, you know? And I mean, I think, I guess, going back to what Rhoda said, you know, if we see those levels of representation in all different ways and spaces, then maybe these sort of things won't be as painful. Maybe we it, it will be normalized. And I don't want to speak for you, Rhoda, if you want to um, um, expound more on what you were um, saying. Yeah, well, I, um, I, I think it's important to note that um, we do live in a world where um, 
diversity hasn't always been so prevalent and certainly diversity has um, not been embraced um, for, for much of our history. So recognizing that we are moving into a different way of seeing things and a different way of being, there's going to be, you know, we can all look forward to the utopian day when, um, you know, someone's on a committee with a blind person or a black person and, and it's just another person. And, um, and we don't think so much about why you're different from me, but that's not the world we're in right now. We're in a world that's trying to transition to being more compassionate and more accepting. So I think um, the whole, well, some of us are trying to be more compassionate and more accepting, and some of us are trying to <laughs> hold on to the old world where everybody's different and in their own little uh, uh, separate space. But I think, I think it's really important to, I don't think there's anything wrong um, in this time that we're living in for organizations, businesses, uh, leadership, administrations, um, purposefully and in, and with the intent choosing someone who's blind, someone who's black, someone who's a woman to serve on a committee, to take a leadership position as long as it's, but there's a difference between, um, checking a box and having the intent that this is a person whose perspective has not been heard before. Mm -hmm. We have traditionally not heard them. We've not listened to them. We've not seen them. We've kept them on the sidelines. So I'm purposefully going to seek to um, have this person who represents the LGBTQ community, who represents uh, a, a blind community, who represents a black or brown community who represents a Hispanic community, who represents the, the Islamic community. I'm going to ask them to take this position of leadership because I want their perspective to be part of the conversation, to be part of the decision-making. It's a perspective we haven't heard before and we need to hear and we need to listen to. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, I catch the nuances of what Raul is trying to say, but I just think it's important to recognize where we are in history and that we're if we're ever going to get to where we're going to go we do have to make some intentional choices to include people who have traditionally not been included and, and i you think you're actually saying kind of the same thing i think you're i think you're uh, raul can correct me if i'm wrong but i think you're basically on the same page and um, i'll tell you the truth i i like what rhoda said not to yeah. cut you off brad i apologize mm -mm. but i want to drill down on it a little bit when i lived in new york city some 25 years ago um you know, the Cosby show was all the rage. And that was a beautiful moment in television history and cultural history. But um, I worked with a group of people that would literally walk around New York City and shut down movie sets. See, because while we celebrated the presence of the Huxtables, we did not have any of those people behind the camera producing sound, engineers or cameras. So, you know, I'm, I'm with Rhoda on what she's saying. And I think you're right about that, Brad. And I think that I just don't want to miss the fact that having the representation in a visual medium or in whatever participation organization that that person may be in, um, we still have to consider the boots on the ground and some of the other influences and factors behind that. I was grateful when the United Way invited me to do some element of the Project Blueprint. I think I did board governance. And I was always careful to stress to the participants that you know, you're on this board for a reason. And while you want to be, uh, the scriptures say, uh, be at peace with all men, sometimes you've got to be confident enough in who you are to raise what might appear to be a contentious point without necessarily articulating it, expressing it with language that adds to the contention. So yes, I want the representation and I want the quality representation, but I also know that just cause you now see it on a commercial or the theater or whatever is not enough. We've got to make certain that those folks, whoever they are, are involved in all of the other levels that lead them to the point where they're elevated to being on the TV screen. And I know we're almost out of time, but I wanted to bring this up because I got a, a post, I, I can't imagine why I can't remember his name right now, but I understand that there's uh, some kind of an LGBT 
group program that's going to be going down over the weekend. And um, um, th this gentleman sent it to me. Um, and I wanted to raise this as a point maybe for meditation or maybe for further discussion at a later time. Um, he said in his post, well, let me put it in context. For the last few years, the city of Mobile has been doing Black History Month, and they invited me to identify films for Black History Month and then bring people together to have a discussion about those films. And it was really, really kind of a cool and positive thing. And I remember at one point I had uh, Chris Bullock from Central Presbyterian. I had Tani Allgood. I may have had someone else. But we had, before we started the film series that year, because every year is a different theme, uh, we had this whole conversation about allies. And uh, the gentleman who posted the program that's coming up tomorrow or this weekend, he said, we don't just need allies anymore. We need co-conspirators, which the first time I'd heard that was like three years ago from Chris Bullock and the distinction between the ally and the co-conspirator. And I don't know that I'm going to say this or couch this in the most perfect way, but um, I believe everybody has a right to make the choices that they want to make. And I support their right to make those choices. And there's some instances where I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with persons advocating for this or for that. And there'll be some instances where I'm not necessarily going to be 10 toes down to be standing shoulder to shoulder with them, but I still advocate for their right to have that choice. And so the distinction between the ally and the co-conspirator is, I don't know if nuance is the right word, and I don't want to say divisive, but I just want to say that um, recognize that from Raul Richardson's perspective, I'm going to be engaging, inclusive, advocate for belonging and supportive of diversity and equity and all those concepts. Um, but if you don't see me, don't think I'm not an ally. And because I haven't shed any blood, don't think I'm not willing to be a co-conspirator. Don't arrive at a judgment about what my position is going to be on any issue um, because I'm always going to be supportive of that diversity, that equity, that inclusion. And I can make my own choice about how much blood I want to spill for your issue versus mine. Um, but, you know, I don't know what that does for this conversation, but I, I wanted to share that because I'm not going to be able to attend that particular event tomorrow. I've got like a full slate of things this week, but um, I know it's an important event and I know um, that my not being there might represent in the minds of some people that I'm not supportive. You dig what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, before we end, Diane has her hand up. Hi, Diane. Hey, I'm so sorry. I was trying to get my mic open and I have like notification after notification after notification popping up getting in my way. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, we get it. Been there, done that. <laughs> I just wanted to add one little thing, kind of on to what Rhoda was saying, because I agree with just about everything she was saying, but I'd like to add just a little bit of a difference that might be just my personal opinion. But um, it reminds me of one time I was having a conversation with a white woman and she was saying, well, I don't see color. I don't see differences. And um it, it kind of left me feeling like she wanted to, for lack of a better term, whitewash everybody in the conversation. And one thing about representation as it pertains to being respectful of the people that you invite to join with you or you include in your work is that I don't know if I ever want to get to the point where I don't see the differences between us. Mm -hmm. I want to appreciate you for what you are and I want to be appreciated for what I am. I'll never not be a black woman. I'll never not be all the other things that I am. And I don't, I don't want anybody to get to the point where they don't see the full me because I'm going to bring a different perspective because of the different things that I am in the life I've led. So um, I just wanted to, add that to the conversation thank y'all thank you for sharing. i like that me too no that's beautiful like that that kind of when we started this conversation i really struggled with it and i struggled when rhoda had talked to me about it and brad and uh raul did a call we did a call together i struggled with like representation because i think if you take it just at surface it's just 
that. We just got a group of folks in the room kind of doing a thing and we've checked the boxes, but have we done the work? You know, have I done the work? Like I think Brian was alluding to, to understand the communities and cultures that need the services that we provide every single day. Do I understand the issues? There may be some stuff that I don't know because it's not a lived experience of mine, but I, do I have enough respect for that lived experience to kind of sit and be present with that and know that there may be needs. And if I can help the most vulnerable person in the room, everybody else is going to be okay. You know, if I can help the person that is the most impacted, that has the most needs, if that's a black trans blind person in a wheelchair, like if you're the most vulnerable in the room, if I can create services around you that, that um, can fulfill those needs of yours, then everybody else is going to be fine. Right. And so I don't know, like, that's really kind of what I struggled with, because if we really don't take the depth of it, do the work around it, have the conversations with it, just being representative is, 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 is not enough. I think it's a topic we could talk about all day in different contexts, but I think we've covered a lot of ground. And I want to thank both of you for joining me on this call. Initially, I thought I was just going to be a passenger on the bus, and then I found that I was driving the bus. So um, thank you for, for helping me to steer um, because I couldn't see where I was going. Uh, I struggled with it a little bit too, although I knew there were points that I wanted to talk about. I just didn't know how to to make it cohesive. And I think we've covered a lot of ground and hopefully we will continue to do so. I think these conversations are helpful. Um, and I think that, um, you know, by having them and not being afraid to have them, hopefully we all grow. That's the goal, right? I'd like to offer a parting thought if I could, Brad. You know, okay. over the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time in Africatown, research, environmental stuff, all kinds of things. And now it's wonderful to see all the emerging things that are happening there. But one of the things, I don't identify with everything that comes out of the African continent, but one of the things I do identify with is frequently in conversations within the context of that cultural community, you have to ask permission to engage. So, and I've kind of embraced that. So, for instance, in, in let's say in Brad's case, okay, uh, before I would go and assist him, it would be more respectful to say, kind sir, uh, I don't know if you're struggling, but if you need some assistance, I'm here to help you. Would that be all right? You know, we, we might want to embrace some of that cultural identity that comes out of Africatown in terms of seeking uh, the guidance of, or being respectful of the ancestors or understanding uh, the importance of asking permission before you include yourself in a conversation or try to offer someone assistance who doesn't think they need assistance. And now you've kind of violated a, a kind of a personal space where you in, inserted yourself into a circumstance that you didn't need to be inserted in. And Diane helped me to think about that. So thank you, Diane. And that's the, that's a big tenant of the disability community as well. Um, especially you see it in the deaf community. Don't try to fix me. I'm not broken. Right. Um, we say that in terms of blind people, if you grab a blind person thinking you're going to steer them to where they need to go, you could cause them to fall because our balance is balance is based on vision and we have none of the latter. So it affects the former. So you're absolutely right. And that's a, that those are those are definitely points to be taken as well. I'm going to turn it over to Tristan to wrap up, but um, I, I've enjoyed the conversation. I hope you have as well. And um, let's do it again sometime. I think there's a lot to be learned. Amen. Peace and blessings to you all. Yes. Thank you to our panelists for taking the time to share their their wisdom and insight and facilitate this conversation. And we cannot thank you enough to our participants. This will be recorded or it is being recorded. And once um, we process the recording, we will share it on our United Way YouTube page. So it will be available to share with your colleagues and your networks. And we, of course, we encourage that. So thank you all again, and we hope you enjoy your weekend. There is a poll just for you to share with us um, how you enjoyed the session or um, other facts that you would like us to know so we could rate ourselves to improve 
these opportunities. And again, thank you. Enjoy your weekend. We appreciate you. All right. Bye-bye, folks. Bye.